This is KGW News at 11. Good evening and thanks for joining us here at 11. I'm Brittany Falkers. New fallout tonight from an investigation into systemic emotional abuse and sexual misconduct in the National Women's Soccer League. Alaska Airlines, a major sponsor of the Portland Timbers and Thorns FC, is now redirecting funds from the teams. For the rest of this financial quarter, the money will instead go to the NWSL Players Association Support the Players Emergency Trust and to youth sports in the Portland area. Alaska Airlines, whose logo is on the front of the Timbers jerseys, said in a statement that they were deeply concerned about their recent findings, adding, our foremost priority is to support players through actions that push for a safe, respectful, and transparent culture at the Portland Timbers and Thorns FCs. Today's announcement comes after a report released last Monday confirmed that the Portland Thorns interfered with an investigation regarding allegations of sexual harassment and misconduct. Since the report was released, the Portland Timbers fired President of Soccer Gavin Wilkinson and President of Business Mike Golub. Also, owner Merritt Paulson is stepping back and turning over decision making to Thorns General Counsel Heather Davis. Now, also developing tonight, a wildfire near Larch Mountain. Washington has burned 70 acres tonight. People can see the flames and smoke for miles. The Nakia Creek Fire is in a remote area north of Washougal, Washington. Crews responded to that fire shortly after 4.30 p.m. And in the morning, air resources will also go to fight that fire. That's according to the Washington Department of Natural Resources. No evacuations are planned at this time. We'll, of course, continue to follow it for you. And you couldn't escape the wildfire smoke and haze this weekend. Just take a look. This is a time lapse looking out toward central Oregon. Yeah, it's hard to see anything from that view. Meteorologist Joe Ranieri is joining me now. And Joe, even here in the Portland metro area, you could smell the smoke, but we're faring much better than other parts of the state. We are, but with that said, Brittany, we are still looking at the uh, air quality kind of taking a hit uh, here the last couple of days. It's hard to believe we're approaching the, the second week of October and we're talking about wildfires. Uh, as we look at the air quality throughout much of the metro area, it's basically down to moderate to the unhealthy for some sensitive groups and you travel into parts of Lane County, it's unhealthy and it's been unhealthy for weeks. That's coming from the, the Cedar Creek wildfire that's been burning since uh, uh, about early mid August or so and the air quality will kind of continue to be uh, relatively poor heading into tomorrow. But as we look at the smoke and haze, it will slowly clear out over the next couple of days because it will have a shift in wind direction. But that shift in wind direction will be bringing some breezy conditions by tomorrow afternoon with gusts up to about 25 to 30 miles per hour. So as we put the uh, elevated smoke forecast in motion, you can kind of see it will slowly move off to the east side of the state by the later part of tomorrow afternoon and into the evening hours. But still, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, some warm temperatures over the next few days. We will start to see a little bit of some cooler temperatures for Monday and Tuesday, but the last couple of days we've been looking at some record temperatures. We saw a high today of 85 degrees at the Portland International Airport. That was a record. Yesterday was close to 90 degrees, and we saw temperatures over in the uh, west side of the metro area in the mid to the upper 70s. Now, I know it's kind of challenging from this picture here, but you can still see some smoke and haze out there tonight, and it's a little after 11 o'clock. And uh, again, you really need some changes in our weather to help clear out the smoke and kind of make things a little bit easier for you. That's not going to be happening anytime soon. Those changes mean wind and some rain. We have that stagnant air that's just been sitting over us for several days. There's a slight chance to see some light rain by late tomorrow night into Tuesday, but it's short lived and a lot of models are showing it's going to be more dry than wet. I'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. Yeah, people really anxious for that change. Thanks so much, Joe. Portland police arrested multiple suspects, all under 18 years old, for allegedly robbing several people at gunpoint overnight. It happened in North Portland, forcing people in the Roseway neighborhood to shelter in place. Authorities found a car with the suspects leaving the area. When police tried to stop them, the driver kept going. Police forced the car to stop, and that's when the suspects jumped out and started running. Authorities did catch everyone. We haven't been told how many people were arrested or how many weapons they had. We do know all are under 18 years old. Luckily, no injuries were reported. This investigation is ongoing. Nobody is safe in Iran. 
This weekend, Portlanders add their voice to the global protests against the Iranian government. The demand for change comes after the death of a young woman killed by police for allegedly violating religious dress codes. Since the start of the protests last month, Iranian women across the world are sharing their personal stories. Blair Best talked with one woman who was beaten and nearly killed for just going to school. Calls for freedom ring out across downtown Portland in the latest rally for Iranian women's rights. Among those protesting is Sudabe Mokri, who has her own story of struggle while growing up in Iran. When I turned 18, it was the time that beginning of the revolution. She was in nursing school. It was the almost one year after the revolution took place in Iran, and the Iranian government wanted to close all the um, uh, universities and colleges in order to expel all the students, the professors, that they do not follow the Iranian government's ideology. The closure sparked protests across Iran, and Sudabe, at 19 years old, took part. And they came with bats, with knives, with guns, and they attacked us. And I was hit in my head uh, so much that uh, I was very dizzy. And they took us, all of us, they shoved us like animals in the back of a truck and took us to a big stadium that was their jail. She was separated from her family with no way to contact them. According to my family, I was in a coma for about a week and they had to search all the hospitals and the places to figure out whether I was alive or not. And I get goosebumps uh, even right now talking about it. Sudabe escaped, but she says this type of violence is only getting worse. Last month, two young women died in Iranian police custody for allegedly violating religious dress code by showing too much hair. Since September, 11 people have been killed in Iran for protesting these rules. That's according to the most recent tally by the Associated Press. I know what Iranian people are feeling right now because uh, I was one of the lucky ones that I survived. That could have been me. That was me. I just had the opportunity to be alive and speak right now. And that's why we are here because every girl, every woman, every man that is saying enough is enough and stop killing us, they are being prosecuted and they are being killed in Iran right now. Sudabe came to Portland in 1990. She learned English, raised two young children, finished nursing school, and eventually wrote two books about her journey and struggles. Decades later, she's now safe, but the rules of the Iranian government have stayed the same for the past 40 years. And it needs to stop. Amid the recent worldwide protests, the Iranian government is cracking down more, cutting off internet access, tapping phone lines, and tightening social media restrictions, making it nearly impossible for people like Sudabe to contact family. She, like many others, are concerned. Nobody is safe in Iran, and we are all hoping that some help, some divine intervention to help Iran so they can they can get the freedom back. In Portland, Blair Best, KGW News. Vandals spray painted a swastika on the sign of a Northeast Portland deli. And the owner says it's just the most recent incident targeting this Jewish owned business. Here's Christelle Kumway. Ben and Esther's vegan Jewish deli has two locations in Portland, one on Northeast Sandy Boulevard and another here on Northeast Alberta. Saturday morning, employees found a hate symbol painted on the door of the shop. Just one of my employees came in in the morning and noticed that there was a swastika um, either spray painted or, or drawn with a paint marker on our front door logo. Store owner Justin King says the swastika was spray painted on the picture of his grandparents. It's more than just a corporate logo. For me, you know, that picture of my grandparents represents... Um, you know, the, the millions of, of Jews who, who either died in or fled the Holocaust. King says this is just the latest in a string of incidents. 
just a week ago or two had um, the the door locks super glued. Um, so we had to spend quite a bit replacing all the locks. He says his Sandy Boulevard location was also targeted a few months ago. Someone called up and asked if we were Jewish or if owned by a Jew and that they were going to come and, you know, do, do some violence. That shop closed for the day after that call and a couple of weeks later had its windows smashed in. I'm not, I mean, I'm not like scared or, you know, feel threatened in any way like that. Uh, it, this just makes me want to show up more. King says the community has shown up to support him, his employees and the business and also to lend their voices. I've spoken out against it. Um, I mean, I think that's the only way that we can combat any kind of hate speech or any kind of, you know, anti-Semitism or racism or sexism or anything is, is by all of us, you know, joining together and speaking out. King says he filed a police report for all the incidents except the threatening phone call. There have been no leads. We also checked with Portland's Anti-Defamation League after hearing about this story. They tracked a 34% increase in incidents like these from 2020 to 2021. I'm Christelle Kimwe for KGW News. A high school in Washington is getting attention for going through a reunification drill. It's to prepare for a major disaster like a school shooting. The drill happened this week at Jackson High School in Everett. Students left class and boarded a bus and were taken to Everett's Memorial Stadium. They were met by district staff who, part who practiced contacting parents and assessing students after a major event. We have to plan for, uh, for events that uh, would require us to bus our students from campus. Of course, we always hope that that never happens. Volunteers played the part of parents reconnecting with their kids. New mothers in southwest Washington have a more convenient way to get donated breast milk for their babies. In July, Legacy Salmon Creek Medical Center turned into a human donor milk pickup site. Tim Gordon reports. For most new moms, breast milk for their babies is relatively easy to provide. And for some mothers, it's not so simple and even impossible to produce themselves, especially if their babies are born early. But the milk is important, says Legacy Salmon Creek specialty dietitian Laura Altman. In some babies, the medically fragile babies, um, human milk is the only option for them. So uh, it means that they would die without it. Um, it's essential to their survival. The good news is some women produce more milk than they need for their own. That's where milk donation comes in. Northwest Mother's Milk Bank is based in Tigard and serves the entire Northwest, collecting, pasteurizing, and dispensing donated mother's milk to babies with a medical need. Now, working with the nonprofit, Legacy Salmon Creek Medical Center is the first donor milk distribution site in Southwest Washington. It works thanks to generous donors like Karina Zukov. Now, how much how much milk have you donated? Like, where are we at? Where are we at on that? Uh, Thirty gallons. <laughs> yeah. Karina donated for three months to give that much. She says it was important to give back after her milk came in. It's a way to say thank you. She relied on donor milk for her daughter and for her son, who was born two months premature. To those women who donated, like it, it makes me tear up. Just, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> And um, it meant so much because um, my babies needed it, couldn't survive without it. The milk in the Legacy Salmon Creek Pharmacy is here for any mom with a referral or prescription. Much more convenient than a trip to Tigard. Kim Roby is another mom who benefited from donated human milk. Her two daughters were born six weeks early before Kim could provide. With them being so premature and so little that giving them those benefits would definitely benefit them in the future um, and help them grow and be the big babies they are now. Donated mother's milk, not the first thing you think of at the pharmacy. Um, well, we know that human milk is the gold standard of nutrition for babies. But with its key woman-made ingredients, it is best for babies. Tim Gordon, KGW News. Coming up.